We power hope. We power dreams. We power life. But there's one power we all have. The power to make a difference. The power to vote. Energy. The power of people. The Lafayette Natural History Museum and Planetarium. Science, technology, and math education for Southern Louisiana. This edition of Louisiana Public Square is coming to you from Lafayette. Tonight's topic is education, grades K through 12. Good evening and welcome to Louisiana Public Square. I'm Beth Courtney. Well, we've taken Public Square on the road tonight to the heart of Acadiana and the Lafayette Natural History Museum. I'm Charles Zeewee. Tonight, with students headed back to classes all across Louisiana this week, we're going to examine public education and specifically K through 12 education. Well, the story of public education in Louisiana these days is a mixture of hope and concern. The state's accountability program is considered to be among the best in the nation. Student test scores are up marginally, but there are still problems, areas, and at least one government watchdog group is predicting the number of failing schools in Louisiana is about to rise dramatically. Louisiana spends about four and a half billion dollars a year to educate its 730,000 public school students. And despite praise for its recent accountability plan, the state's long history of poor results has fostered the view that public education, especially grades K through 12, is something that needs fixing. But social issues from poverty to lack of parental involvement all influence what goes on in Louisiana's schools. The struggle over desegregation continues to haunt school systems throughout the state. Cases, some of which are decades old, are still pending in 50 parishes. With more than two out of five beginning teachers leaving public schools within three years, teacher attrition ranks as one of the biggest education challenges. Council for a Better Louisiana's Stephanie DeSell is concerned. They transfer to non-public schools or out of state or some simply just don't stay in teaching. Um, I think many of them say that they find that the environment of the school is, is just, they feel that it's not professional. They're not getting the support they need. They're not getting the professional development they need to deal with these, these situations that perhaps they didn't learn about when they were in college. The biggest changes in Louisiana's approach to education revolve around its student and school accountability system begun in 1999. At the core of the program is high stakes testing. Exams are aligned with content standards created for each subject. Longtime teacher Barbara DeQueer describes the dilemma of teaching and testing. We have state tests, national tests. I'm in a classroom. Am I more concerned about teaching to this test, or am I more concerned about giving the kids and helping the kids acquire the content that I think as a professional of 30 years experience that I know that they will need in order to be successful in other in more advanced science courses. The LEAP test measures fourth and eighth grade students mastery of English and math. In 2003 more than half of the students in these grades achieved the basic level meaning they demonstrated fundamental knowledge and skills in these subjects. The Iowa test compares students to a national norm while significant gains were made between 1999 and 2003 in some grades, Louisiana's student scores on the most recent Iowa tests generally showed only slight improvements. Overall, state scores remain near the national average. Another reform requires high school students to pass the graduation exit exam before they can receive their diplomas. Those who fail are given five additional chances to pass the exam before graduation day. Schools are also graded under Louisiana's accountability system. While the number of schools at the highest level increased in 2003, so did the number deemed academically unacceptable. A recent Louisiana constitutional amendment allows the state to take over these failing schools. This fall, the University of New Orleans College of Education will operate one of 14 New Orleans schools eligible for takeover. Orleans Parish Superintendent Anthony Yamato will watch UNO's efforts closely. And they're going to try new methodologies, new ways of teaching, new strategies to see if in fact the way they do their business 
will significantly affect in a positive way the children attending CAPTO. From my perspective, I have absolutely no problems with that. Louisiana's accountability program had just started when the federal No Child Left Behind Act was passed. Because many of its testing and accountability requirements were mirrored in Louisiana's plan, the state has fared far better than most of the nation in complying with the law's mandates. But because the federal law sets the bar higher for student proficiency, trouble looms ahead, according to Jim Brandt, head of the Public Affairs Research Council. Our study has shown that uh, if the No Child Left Behind Act goes forward without any changes, Louisiana, like many other states, is headed toward a train wreck. PAR's year-long study indicates that without an investment in the hundreds of millions of dollars, the state's accountability program cannot be kept on track. Our estimate shows that uh, a few years down the road that uh, easily 75 percent or more of the schools in Louisiana will not meet the federal goals uh, that are set forth in law. That prediction is for several years from now, and Louisiana, along with many other states, is counting on changes in the law to avert a crisis. Fortunately, the state's existing accountability program will provide some breathing room until then. State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education member Leslie Jacobs helped launch Louisiana's accountability program in the late 90s. I think the key is we've spent, we spent the last number of years putting in place this policy that's getting rated number one in the nation and a test that's rated in the top five in the nation. But those are policies. To really improve education in the state, we have to change what happens in the classroom and the schoolhouse. What is the interaction between that teacher and that student? That student in the school, that school and the child's family. You know, we can't really make that happen at the state level. We have 1,400 schools in the state with 68 school districts. And fundamentally, education is a local issue. Speaking of issues, education consistently ranks as a top issue in just about every poll of Louisiana residents. We asked the people here tonight to give education a grade, and our participants here tonight gave public schools only a C. We also asked them uh, about a series of other questions concerning their attitudes toward public education when we invited them to take part in our program here tonight. That survey, by the way, was conducted by the Riley Center for Public Policy Research at LSU. We used random digit dialing and we recruited participants from the Lafayette general area. Our poll, by the way, of tonight's participants indicates that they think education in Louisiana is about the same as it is in other states in the southeastern U.S. By a slight margin, they support giving vouchers to parents of children in failing schools to pay those parents to send their kids to private or parochial schools. At the same time, they are optimistic that public schools in Louisiana will get better over the next several years. Politically, by the way, our participants are middle-aged and mostly Democrats who are evenly split in classifying themselves as conservatives, moderates, or liberals. In terms of issues, teacher quality was ranked as being very important to the state of public schools in Louisiana. So let's start there tonight. And, and by the way, you can talk about anything you like, but let's start about uh, teacher quality. And, and we should mention and stress that this is a random sample, but in our random sample tonight, we have several teachers, including one elementary school principal. Totally random, folks. So who wants to go first? What about <laughs> teacher quality? How important is that? Let's, let's ask the teachers first. Mm -hmm. I think teacher quality is very important, and I do think we have highly qualified teachers. I think one of the problems is, uh, as we mentioned in our um, information that we got, that we don't get paid enough. The, through the No Child Left Behind Act, they're making it a lot more stringent uh, requirements of us. We have to pass tests to show that we have the knowledge to teach when we've already received our diplomas several years ago, some of us. And, but we're not getting pay increases. Some of us are getting more stringent time um, allotments as far as our teaching is concerned. How about Felicia? Yes. Um, well, I feel also, as she does, the quality of the teachers are there. Uh, the incentives, on the other hand, are not. Not to say that we're not there for the children. Yes, that is our first concern. But we also need some kind of reinforcements in ourselves to show that, you know, give us some reason, not necessarily a reason, but um, what word do I want to use? Um, more of a purpose to do what we do. 
um, I work at a in an area that is uh, considered at risk, and I know on a daily basis there are a lot of issues that um, legislature does not get to see. Like what? Um, I live. In, I teach at a, a very a poverty, low, a low socioeconomic school, at risk students. A lot of the students there are um, from the lower income projects and that type of thing. And their socio their social development isn't there. So not only do you have to teach to the content, you have to teach to their social development, and that in itself can take up most of your time. John, you teach high school? Yeah. No, sir. Uh, community college. Right? I'm yeah, sorry. Community college. Right? And we get a wide range of people there. And it, it runs the gambit of those that are totally unprepared to those that need maybe a semester with us and they can go on to the university. But I think as far as teacher quality, I work with some of the best people mm -hmm. I've ever worked with. And it's discouraging <coughs> for most of us. And I, I echo the sentiments of uh, the other lady, the other ladies here, uh, that we ha we have an important job, but we're not treated as if we're we're doing an important job sometimes, and that's not ha that doesn't have anything to do with the people we work with. It has to we're, if we're going to put the, the amount of time and effort and dedicate we're going to dedicate our lives to doing something like this to make something better then I think we should be paid a commiserate salary that we can actually live on or provide for our own children because, I mean, it's, it's, not, a, it's not really a matter of money as far as teaching is concerned, but to be thought of and treated as a professional who's doing a professional job and has a commitment. I mean, we see athletes getting millions of dollars and they have a talent, yes, but they're not really instructing, they're not really showing people how to build their lives or how to grow. Gibson is our school uh, principal, the elementary school principal. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but are all your teachers equally qualified? Are all of, are, are their performances all? They're all, all high. <coughs> let me put it this you way. You can take the Fifth Amendment, by the way. They're all highly qualified. Okay. And, and I'd like to say that if education is going to improve, it's got to be in the classroom. Teachers number one. If it doesn't happen in the classroom, it's not going to happen. So it's very important that uh, as an administrator, you nourish a staff and provide those opportunities and resources for them to constantly uh, get better. And that way you improve education. It's not a lot of very sophisticated programs that get the job done. It, it's uh, proven programs, two, three simple programs uh, that the teachers understand and teach very well. In yep. those ways, you improve education. Let me hear from some of the other people here tonight, uh, the non-teachers. Um, what do you think? Well, I'm a mother of five. I have a five-year-old um, all the way to a 16-year-old. And um, I do believe Louisiana has a lot of qualified teachers because I see it, you know, teaching my children. But um, what I do think that could improve a lot in Louisiana is parent involvement. Because I talk to so many teachers and, and they're all saying basically the same thing. It would be great if parents would just support us, you know, from the ground up. What, what we teach the children if the parents aren't supporting and encouraging, you know, reading and math skills and, and the time it takes for a parent to sit down and support their child and their homework and their schoolwork. If they're not doing it, you know, it's it's going to show in the classroom big time. Wait. I think one of the important things, of course, the school teachers spend half their life with the children that go to school, and that's an important role. Uh, I hear a lot of parents say, uh, teachers say, well, you should spend time, parents should spend time, but one of the things, I've been a scout leader for 43 years, and I think one of the problems you have is that a lot of the parents may not have the education to help their kids. And that's a problem. Children go home with math that some of the parents may not understand, some of the different, you know, vocal areas that, that uh, parents can't express themselves. So I think the teacher is probably the key role. And uh, I remember when I was a young kid, we had study hall and things of that sort to help us get get through 
the school year. I got sent to study hall, but not to study. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, Principal? Kyle, how about you? To agree with everyone else so far, I do believe also that it goes back to the teachers. They are the ones who are there uh, with the students to push them, to encourage them, to motivate them. Um, without the teachers having their hands on and, and being productive and, and being the professional like you spoke of, it's impossible for the children to learn at, at the rate that is needed. Um, we have highly qualified teachers here in the state and, and I'm just coming through all the, through the elementary and through the high school and just finishing college, I mean, you do see the teachers who are there and obviously they're not there for the money, they're there because they love it. So that does need to be supported. Erna, Sheila, Ed? <laughs> he mentioned money. Um, I have several degrees and worked for 37 years and have not made $50,000 a year yet. <laughs> you work as a teacher? I retired. I'm retired now. I you, work. You should be a saint, but anyway. So tell, us, <laughs> so tell us about that. I mean, how have well, things changed? When did you retire? In 2000. So you're fresh out of the system. Yes, fresh out. Uh, how has things so, changed? So looking at, that, the, looking uh, at the whole system, what would you say about the state of education in this state? In this state, I, I do not know of any other, but this particular one, I've never worked outside of the state. But um, I feel that the teachers are qualified, teachers are hardworking, teachers are uh, loving uh, people. They try to um, let the kids know that the, you know they're there for their, their purpose. And um, So where's the problem? I'm not sure where the problem is, but there are problems. I think it has to be a combined effort. Mm -hmm. It can't just be the teachers, and it can't just be the home. It can't just be the student. It has to be a combined effort of all three facets. Okay. Okay. Jim, go ahead. Uh, the history of Louisiana also is a telling point in that we, as we were founded as a French colony and then became a Spanish colony, Education was not subsidized and was not supported by the government, was not supported by any kind of bureaucracy. If you were going to get an education, you had to pay for it out of your own pocket. So unless, if you had to work in the fields all day, or you had to work in a shop or whatever you were doing, mm -hmm. unless you could pay to go to school, and usually it was out of the state or in these private ac academies, it wasn't emphasized. And being so highly agricultural, it wasn't emphasized. It was learn enough to, to work what you have to do and then, and then do it. And that mental attitude has lasted to the present day. I mean, when I started college, my, my father was very proud of my going to college, but he was really impatient for me to start teaching. He said, what you gonna do, be in school all your life? And I said, yeah, I probably will. And one way or another, student or teacher. And that's what I, I love doing and I love being in the classroom. But the, the heritage that we have is that it's an anti-intellectual uh, attitude. You only need enough education to get a job. And that history is stronger than just the last 10 to 20 years. Because it's, it's a mental attitude that a lot of people have, whether they say it or not. Ned, you've been taking all this in. Yeah, um, I'm a Cajun. When I, when I learned to speak English, I guess I was about five or six. And we had a lot of influence from the parents to make sure you learned something. And it was not only influential uh, speaking from your parents, but there was a lot of urging, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I think there's, I, got, I, I have four kids. My oldest one is a doctor. And my youngest one is about 22, he's a welder. Every one of those I feel as a father is just as bright as the others. But I don't feel like my 22-year-old knows what my 36-year-old knows as a, as a general education format. I don't think none of them got the education I got. Even though I speak bad English, I can write good English, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think there's a method that Either the school system, the school board, the federal government, or political means is pushing classes 
or areas of education and not, not getting the education basics quick enough in the kids, trying to, I mean, if, if you learn how to dance in school, it won't get you a job. If you learn how to sing, it won't get you a job unless you get lucky and you're you a, a rap artist. But if you learn the basics, you can go home and read and you can learn anything you want. And I think that's the problem is not so much teacher quality, but what teachers are allowed to do or forced to do. So what do you think of education? Well, I asked about, mentioned grades earlier. What grade did you give education in this state? Well, we asked you what a grade. Oh. You had to grade education in Louisiana. I didn't take the poll. You I didn't take the poll. Okay. A non-answer. Sheila. Um, as I was growing up, I, we lived in several states, so I went to several different schools in several different states. And I find that in Louisiana, we don't have um, our system structured for the benefit of the students. And a lot of the schools that I went to, they had supplies. They were way ahead of the game, so say, in, in their teaching skills and in what they provided to the students. And I think that's a little bit of where we might be lacking, to provide more as a state for the students in the classroom. The, the teacher can only be as good as the thing she's given to teach with. You know, she can only do as much as she's given, you know. And if they put limits on what she can teach, that has an effect. One of the things we asked in our poll, and we'll ask you again here, uh, is about testing. I mean, in the news, on the newspa in the newspaper just about every day, uh, the state is talking about testing, about failing schools, about which number of students, which percentage of students pass the LEAP test or the graduate exit exam. And, and when we asked the, uh, the, the larger group of people we invited to attend, they said overwhelmingly they thought there was too much emphasis on testing. So to everybody, do you think that too much is being made of testing? Yes. I do. Please Please do. Tell me about it, Felicia. I feel that if a student can attend high school and pass from kindergarten to 12th grade and can't pass the test, something is wrong mm -hmm. with the test or something is wrong with the process because how can a student attain first grade kindergarten all the way through 12th grade and can't exit because they can't pass the GEE something is wrong with that picture well, if you have to have standardized testing which we do and one it says you're trying to put everybody in the same categories and everybody has to pass through the same and they're the same, all the same. It's like herding cattle to the same shoot. Also, if they have to take tests after they've taken these classes and they pass these classes, what are you saying to the teachers that taught them? We have to make sure that you, they taught you and you passed it, but we got to make sure that you did it. And then you're questioning their professionalism and their, inte their teaching integrity. Well, we had a situation in uh, New Orleans last year where a young lady was a valedictorian of her high school and failed the exit exam. Wayne. Well, are there results that, that, let me ask the teachers a question. Uh, is there a big difference once they take the test? Is there a gauge you follow? Your answer is right next door. I'd like to comment on that. I know that testing had met, has made us a better school because we've had to focus on specific uh, guidelines given to us by the State Department of Education, benchmarks. So we're no longer guessing on what the state wants us to teach the students of this state. The state has been very clear on what we are to teach. And uh, I try to get my teachers to, to know the curriculum and to teach it very well. And the question it, is, though, are you teaching the test? Uh, to some extent, we are. We're teaching towards the test. Towards we don't test. teach the test itself. And I'll repeat, as a result of the accountability uh, guidelines that we've been given, we are a better school because of it. Now, we may be a small, a major, uh, a small minority of schools that think that we have improved, but I think if statistically you look at the results given to us, 
from the State Department, the majority of the schools in this state are improving. And I think it's the result of higher accountability standards. Well, we have about 73, and then see some uh, Superintendent Picard can correct me on this when he comes out here a little bit later, but I think we have 73 failing schools in the state, 54 are in Orleans Parish alone. But what do we do about those failing schools that, in, in terms of testing? But, are, are we making too much of all of this? Well, we have to remember we have 1,400 schools or more in this state that are doing well. So, yes, there will always be a small minority that will do well. It well, doesn't make any difference. Ruby? I feel like we do have to have some accountability standards. We have to stop graduating high school seniors that cannot read or do basic math. And that what, that's what the statistics were before we had the, this accountability standards. We have to start somewhere. And maybe it's going to get worse before it gets better. But we have to attempt in some manner to correct it. Can I ahead, ask a question? What, what grade, uh, when, we, when I went to school, 100 was perfect. And then you, 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 hopefully you got the 75 to pass. These tests that y'all talking about, what, what, what percentage of the test do you have to pass? Well, it's different sets. It's, it's math, it's English. <laughs> right, but in each subject, what percentage? Basically, it's about 50, 50 to 60 percent of it. I think that's sad. If you can't get somebody to pass at least, you know, three quarters of what they're supposed to pass, then, then uh, we're in a lot of trouble. Verna, what do you think of testing? I mean, you're, you're out now, so you can say whatever you want. <laughs> well, I agree with uh, testing. I mean, how would you ever learn um, the uh, efficiency, the uh, level, the um, whatever it is that you're trying to reach? Uh, you do have to test. I don't think you can get away from it. But is it fair? Does it really measure what the kids know? Or is it... Does it, does it measure... I would think so. In terms of what, if, if we, we're running out of time for this segment, believe mm -hmm. it or not, real quickly, to all of you, if you could do one thing today, right now, tonight, to change Louisiana schools for the better, what would it be, real quick? I, I would begin with the uh, real young kids. Begin yes. there, teaching them uh, to have a love for uh, the materials and when they enter school, they would be ready for learning. We're going to believe the other answers for the experts that, comes, <laughs> that are coming up. And uh, believe it or not, that wraps up the first part of our discussion tonight. We'll take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by state education officials who will take questions directly from our participants. By the way, you can be part of Public Square, too, by taking our survey on education online at lpb.org. We'll be right back. As we continue on Public Square now, we're joined by Board of Elementary and Secondary Education member Mary Washington, Bessie President Glennie Lee Buquet, and State Education Superintendent Cecil Picard. Thank you all for joining us tonight, and let's get right into it. Uh, we have our uh, participants here tonight. Who's got a question? I have a question. Uh, is it true, I just heard, that you could fail a major subject and one, one major subject a year and pass on to the next grade and, and, and continue failing that same subject year after year? Uh, you're talking about a subject in school or are you talking about a subject on the, on the high stakes test, the LEAP no, test? No, I'm talking about in school, English, uh, math. Evidently, that's a local, a local matter where a student would, would fail, say, math and, and pass all the other subjects. Uh, that is very unlikely, but uh, we've heard of a lot of strange things that have happened in public education in Louisiana uh, over the years, and uh, it's certainly not something that I think a, an administration uh, and a school and a principal uh, would be aware of and would approve of. Uh, that students would have to meet uh, passing all subjects, at least prior to 1996, that was one of the reasons why we initiated high-stakes testing. Uh, it's still the best show in town, 
because of the fact that we had to have a checkpoint. Students were graduating from high school with a meaningless diploma. Whether they were going to college, they had to take 50% or more of their uh, courses uh, were remedial courses and earned no credit, uh, or they could not get a job because they could not fill out a simple application in many cases. So uh, I don't know that any of this would be uh, uh, a true statement today. Would be happening now. Hopefully you not. Did you want to say something? No, it, well, we have blocked scheduling in most of our high schools now, and I just wondered if perhaps there is a, a, an occasion where a student might fail a course but be allowed to go on in the other courses in the block scheduling, but he would not be able to graduate unless... I think he was mostly he talking about the elementary of. grades. Talk, talking about the elementary grades? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you meant high school. Mm -hmm. uh, but does that answer satisfy you, Ned? Well... It, uh, not exactly. <laughs> um, I, I don't know whose toes I'm going to step on, but if a teacher tells me that, I, I'm going to believe her. Now, I haven't been in school. My, my kids are grown up, so I, I don't know if a third grader can pass to the fourth grade, but this is what this is about. I'm trying to find out. Now, So you're saying it's a parish ruling? It, it truly is a parish ruling, yes. and I would say yes, state. that is um, something that is going on in some of the um, parishes. Well, I mean, it, some some folks are still caught up in worrying about the immediate self-esteem of students rather than worrying about um, how that child is going to earn a living when they leave the system. But it is a local decision. Because I would think the self-esteem when you get out of school would be a little more oh, important than oh, when you you're in second it. grade. You well, also, or also, when you have, you're expected to pass the LEAP test in eighth grade and you have not passed the school courses, it makes it a lot more difficult for you. I'd like you. to comment on that. Now, uh, every parish has a pupil progression plan mm -hmm. and it is approved by the <laughs> State Department of Education. So um, I don't know what standards the State Department of Education does, but we as principals in, in the local parishes follow our pu uh, parish pupil progression plan, and um, uh, this is what we base our uh, either promotion or failure from parish pupil progression plans. Well, what about but, social promotions, though? Because that's what we're, we're talking about here. Some parishes are doing what other parishes are not, uh, apparently. And I mean, one parish in particular allowed students to participate in graduation ceremonies last spring if they signed a contract to come back and attend summer school. I mean, do you, what do you think of that? Of something like that? I of social we don't promotion? Like it. Why don't you like it? <laughs> because I think that the diploma should really mean something. And to get a Louisiana State diploma, you should pass the exit exam as well as your your 23 Carnegie unit courses that are demanded for a diploma. You either have passed or you haven't. So walking is meaningless if you can't get a job and you haven't gotten that diploma. So it is a reward in a sense. Graduation and everything that goes with it is for those who pass, not for those who fail. We, we keep talking about the testing. Is there a group or somebody opposing the testing procedures on a state level? Well, is everybody happy with testing at the state level? Do, have we had positive responses from the universities and from the workforce, the business sector, since we've instituted the GEE, uh, the graduate exam, about the quality of the students and workers they're getting? Well, Has certainly the uh, remediation rate the remediation rate in has gone down in colleges, which is what we've looked at and are able to see right now. And Super that's big happening right Wait, away. Let, let me just say in responding to, to the whole, the big picture, uh, since 1996, where the, the former administration and legislature have put a billion dollars of new money, have given 35% raises to, to teachers to, to grade upgrade the profession, and we still have a long way to go. I agree with all of you who said that uh, that you know, we need to get teacher salaries closer to the national average and respect for teachers, and teachers have to also have a clean, safe environment to work in. But in addition to that, uh, we're nationally recognized. We're number one in accountability in the nation. We're fifth in teacher quality. Uh, we're sixth uh, in many other categories. Uh, 
uh, technology, we've come a long way. The, the, the bad part of it is that we're still dead last in the nation in technology. We were 88 to 1 when I became superintendent in our multimedia ratio. We have it down to 5.5 to 1 now, but that's a moving target. So all of these things we're, is a moving target. We're moving up. But to answer your question, yes, we have public confidence now, and the private sector is also excited because now a high school diploma is worth something. When a kid goes to college, they don't have to take remediation courses nearly to the degree they had to. Well, Wayne, did you get your question answered? Yeah, portion. <laughs> How about about the uh, the train wreck? Uh, Jim Brandt from PAR was on earlier in the program talking about the train wreck because the uh, the the standards are backloaded toward uh, the accountability standards are backloaded. What about that? Are any of you concerned well, about that? Here? Let me just say, I know a lot of people were shocked when they read the headlines of, of what Jim said, and Jim's ab absolutely right uh, because I made that same predicament and speech in 2002 when I spoke to the National NAEP Board who was attending a conference in New Orleans. And Education Week was covering it and they wrote the story. And of course the U.S. Department of Education and the White House were not very happy with me. But I made the prediction and, and, and so it confirmed when Jim Brandt came out. But I feel very, very comfortable that no matter who's going to be elected president and who's going to be elected to Congress this fall, the 109th Congress, which is going to convene in January, there will be some changes made. Because even states like Connecticut and New Jersey and Maine that doesn't nearly have the poverty and the disproportionate amount of socioeconomic problems like Louisiana has, they're also saying that it's headed for a train wreck. So we know that the, the it's impossible to say that you're going to grade and have to show annual yearly progress in four categories, limited English proficiency, ethnicity, special ed, and poverty. Uh, one child could fit all of those categories and put the whole school in school improvement. That is totally unrealistic, and we think very, uh, we, we, we feel very firmly that whoever's in power in 2005, changes will be made. Crystal, you're looking over here like you don't know if you buy this. No, uh, what, what I was thinking is that, um, you know, when you're saying we're doing so well by accountability standards, but there are so many experts who are looking at what we're doing and saying we're fixing to have problems, you know, where did we fall? Where, where did we make the mistake? Is it because we didn't start testing sooner? Has curriculum changed and gotten better since then? And then the testing is reflecting that? I, I, I think it's a mixture of all of it. The simple answer here is that the No Child Left Behind has unrealistic expectations. For example, the federal law says that every child must achieve basic. That includes mentally retorted children. Um, that it is our responsibility to ensure that every child is basic or above. Now, all of us know that that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And we can sit here and, you know, and, and, and we're in voodoo land, you know. Okay. And, of course, better would be New Orleans, but even if we throw some little dust out, we will not have children achieving that. Now, in terms of the accountability program that Louisiana put together, it is our belief that we have a good system going and that we're continually improving the academic um, needs of uh, levels of our children and our children are doing better. Um, regardless of how tough it is on the classroom teachers and the schools and the parents and so forth, everybody knows that our children are getting better. Mm -hmm. And the children know they are getting mm -hmm. better. And mm -hmm. that's the important part, yes. that they know that when they receive that A on their report card, that it means something today, unlike the old days, when the A may just have come so that we would not have to um, argue with parents that it was easy to give a child an A rather than have to have a conference after school or something of that nature. That's the train wreck we're going towards. I, I, don't, I, I think that's an illogical statement. If the state since 1999, like, like uh, is written down, mirrors the no, left, uh, no child left behind, then the, the original educational program was just as flawed as uh, no, left, no Child Left Behind. Oh, it's now, not, if, it, if it mirrors it, now, if you want to change the word, we're not going to play semantics here, but there's a, a short of mental retardation. Everybody should have basic education. It shouldn't be uh, out of reach. 
except for mental retardation. Well, and, that, and that's the point Mayor is making. And let me just tell you what we realistically can reach in this state. But that's not what the law says. The law says that by 2014, every child, every, that's 100%, shall be basic. We know in this state that we can realistically reach a goal of about 90 to maybe 92%. That's possible. 100% is impossible because of the fact of we have to include all these special population students. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what we do, it's impossible to reach that goal. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're saying here. We can realistically reach 90 to 92%, but not 100. Kyle, you're the recent college graduate here, right? Yes, sir. You, you don't have a family yet, I take it, right? Yes, sir. But you will. <laughs> yes, sir. Where are you going to send your kids to school? <laughs> um, I always went to a private school. Um, my parents worked hard to send me and all of my brothers and sisters to a private school. Um, nothing against the public schools that we have here. That's just something that I feel in my heart that I always got something out of, and there was something special because of that. Um, the, the topics that we've talked about so far today are, are topics that I, I kind of never encountered going to those private schools as far as the, the lack of parental involvement or the lack of the teacher quality. Um, it was something I always felt whenever I got that grade, I, I did accomplish something. And, and we were always prepared to go that extra mile. And I know there's a lot of good public schools out here, and I have a lot of friends and family who are public school teachers, who are quality teachers. But I, I don't know if they're getting the education to further it, if they're just trying to get out of high school, or if they're trying to be furthered into the college. Okay, but at, at some point, real soon, you're going to start paying taxes, and those taxes are going to public education, some of those taxes. What do you want from public education? Quality people. Quality... What do you want from these people, I'm asking this specifically? What, what is, do you want to what hear? What is new and upcoming as far as to, to increase the education that our, our kids are getting? What is, are there any new ideas, any new uh, research that coming, that's coming out to it that we can put into play to, to see these improvements, or are any new... Uh, trains of thought or any new patterns that we're going to try to attack. Who wants to take that? I'll take that. <laughs> um, you're absolutely right, but that's what we should do, and we, we do do a lot of research constantly, both as board members and the department has people doing that all the time. And we know that we are leaving the industrial revolution and we're going into a global economy. So the way that we used to teach and the subjects we used to teach students is not enough for them to be prepared for the global economy, just looking at technology alone. And that's one reason why the board has made policy that we need continuing ed credits for our teachers, not because they might not have been good when they first left school, but because that's the only way you keep up. You've got to continually hone your skills and find out what the latest brain research is, what it shows about teaching children, all of those things are continually changing as our world changes. So we have to have continuing ed for our teachers if we're going to prepare our students mm -hmm. well. We all learn something new every day. Exactly. And, and if that exactly. doesn't continue with our children. <coughs> you know, I want to just want to get to vouchers and charter schools, but, but before we do that, really quickly, Felicia, Gibson, Verna, teachers, retired teachers, you're hearing stuff here tonight. Is anything different than you've heard before? Um, Mm, that's one thing that I, I would like to add to public education that uh, as far as for testing for those students who are having trouble passing those tests and with the, the uh, mentally challenged students, we have a program in place here in Louisiana, uh, the Skills Options Program. That's a very good program. I've had uh, success, we've had a lot of success rate with those particular students who are having trouble passing those tests they enter this program, and most of these kids are mentally challenged kids. Students who would not have had the opportunity to graduate in March are now actually exiting school with something functional that they can go out into society and- So what would you like to ask them? What would you like to I would ask like to ask people? what more can we do with the skills options students? What can, what avenues, different avenues can we take to assure that they actually get their GEDs? because some of them are struggling with the GED and they're finishing only with the skill. Is there something more that's going to be coming? Well, we have made this available at the state level. What more can be done is for the locals to take advantage of that. 
Uh, we, you're absolutely right. We now have uh, challenged students who have an opportunity to leave with a, a scale certificate or even a GED. Yeah. And in some cases, uh, some of them who are late bloomers can actually go on to college. Okay. Or while they're in the skills program, get back on track and start earning Carnegie units and graduate with a regular high school diploma. All of these are possible. We just need to have more of the LEAs, more of the local districts to take advantage of that program. So which means, when you say take advantage, you mean like... Join the program. program. Yes, yeah, some of them are still not into the program. They're still not all. So it's not statewide? It's statewide, but they're, they're not all taking advantage of it on a statewide level like some districts are. Some of the larger systems have very few. Some of the smaller systems have a pretty good disproportionate number. But we have some large systems in the state that have not taken advantage of it to the, the degree they should because that's where a lot of that population is. Mm -hmm. We're, believe it or not, running out of time. Well, Gibson, Carl you know. mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago uh, what's new in, in public education. <clears throat> very little has been mentioned of, of technology. I think it's very important that our teachers incorporate technology in everyday instructions. And, and I'd just like to say at my school, every child gets their hands on a computer in some way 40 minutes a day. And I think it's made a big difference in, in our school performance scores. So uh, you have to have the resources to do that. And we've been fortunate enough that uh, we were able to get an AG grant, which has really enhanced our program. What about vouchers? It's, it's talked about just about every year, at least some attempt is made in the legislature to get it passed. It keeps coming back. I sent four of my, my four children to a parochial school, and I'm a public school teacher, and I don't believe in the voucher system, and it could have helped me out a lot because I was on a single income for a good many years. I don't believe in the voucher system because I think it's very, very important that the public support public education. And with the voucher system, the better schools will get better and the worse schools will get worse. Gibson's question is to the Bessie board, and I guess to Superintendent Picard too, about failing schools. What about those failing schools? What are you going to do? But let me take a stab. One of the schools, um, University of New Orleans, has kept come forward and they have asked for the challenge to help turn around the school. The other schools are actually working in what we consider a recovery district, trying to improve their scores. If there's somebody coming forth and want to work with that particular school, Bessie's all ready for it. I mean, the, the idea of us being able to take the school over from the district isn't that every time a school fails, we're going to run in and take it over. The idea is, you have a failing school, what are you doing about it? If you're doing nothing, we're going to do something. that answer your question there, Gibson? Yeah, the, the reason I ask, because I served on that uh, a uh, UNO committee oh, okay. in that program. When, when you say you were going to do something about it, does that mean the staff, you replaced the staff? Uh, that, that is always an option, but it's not necessarily something that um, we have made that decision. But in terms of when I said we're going to do something, we, number one, would take over the management of that school. Mm -hmm. And once you take over the management of the school, then everything else you know, falls into place. Is changing out staff an option? Always. Everybody satisfied with that answer? Everybody shaking their heads? I, I, I Felicia's like, not shaking her head. <laughs> I was curious as to how do you make those decisions as to how do you, what's the, what is the process for coming in and just, and, and taking over a school and improving it? If the scores are down, how do you, what is the process? We've been in school okay. improvement for years, for years. Like four years. Four years. I understand that, but when you say we, school, you mean the okay. the local, or is it a state? Is it a state? It would be a state in, decision. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so you're going to so bring it outside. The local is in control of the schools already. Correct. Okay. For example, there's um, correct me if I'm wrong, Superintendent. There's a school whose school performance score is 10.1, and and in all these years they have had the opportunity to get up to 12 point something. Okay. Now, that's a problem. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Yeah, yes. yes. okay. You know, so at some point, you cannot continue to say eh, it's no big deal. If the district doesn't do something, the state is obligated to ensure that we're helping all schools. And the process, I think that's what you were yes, asking. Yes, the process. That's why we have formed the recovery district. And um, it, it's a separate, it's an entity of the state. Okay. And so if Bessie says, 
look, these are the schools that are eligible to go into the recovery district because they have been failing schools for so many years and have not recovered, then we put out an RFP and say, who will take over these schools? And we work with them. We had several people originally come to take over schools in Orleans, and when they saw what was involved, they all dropped out except UNO. So then we go back to the superintendent and we say, all right, what are you and the board going to do? And as Bessie members, we called the board members in and we called the superintendent to meetings with us and we said, what are you going to do? Give us a solid plan. And we had them come back four different times because we didn't think the plan was detailed enough. And then we work with them and the superintendent sends staff members into those schools and he helps that local district, and that's what we would do with all of them. But we're all feeling our way with this. Certainly, Bessie itself isn't going to go in and stay up the school, so that's why we have the recovery district, and we have to have a superintendent of that district to oversee it all. Isn't the score, uh, the, the way they get the score sometimes, not the fault of the, dis the school system at all? Doesn't a absence, number of student absences go into account? Suspensions, expulsions, dropouts? And a lot of those factors have, the school system cannot do anything about it, but that does bring down the score, correct? It can bring, it's a, it's a small part of the score, the absenteeism. 10%. Ten, ten it, it's, in some schools it's fine five. if you have the dropout and oh, the absenteeism. But we also feel that there are things schools can do. They can make a bigger effort to have parents come in, and there are a lot of models in the nation that we, if we have a school with that problem, we can go in. We, so you the think department parent and, involvement would be an important thing? Well, but And there are other things to help students, and one of them is technology. That has been a huge carrot to a student who is used to playing video games to come into school and learn with that. So we might look at a district and say, you need to put more of your funding into technology, and you need to teach your teachers how to use it not to be afraid of it and bring the students in. And we, we know that absentee rates drop when technology comes in. So is that school using scores it? go up. And scores go up. They do? Yes. Okay. Yes, we have a lot of my, a lot of research to show that. You seem skeptical, Crystal. Well, I, I, I have a background in computers, and I know a little bit about technology and technology in the schools, actually. But, um, you know, I feel like students need to have that as part of their education, but if we make it too big of a chunk of their education and emphasize it too much, uh, culturally, technology is supported. So at the, in their home, most students can do everything on the computer. Most students, or they have access to it at the public library for free, and I see a lot of kids taking advantage of that. Um, kids can basically teach us about technology because they know it's instinctive. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to see Louisiana's money go more towards getting the basics and not so much in technology because it becomes obsolete so fast. You know, equipment. But it's a, it's a proper balance. Uh, the, the, uh, the parish in Acadiana that scored the highest uh, on the LEAP scores, I called the superintendent and I said, if you had to tell me just one thing, why did you score the highest in Acadiana, a small rural parish? Mm -hmm. Without hesitation, he told me technology. Because of the kids who come from low socioeconomic backgrounds, that was their catalyst. That was their motivation to come to school. They, it, they had very little absenteeism, and they were excited. From, rather than a, one from an affluent family who had that, uh, probably from the time that they were born, had access to a computer. These poor kids used that as a catalyst and did very well academically, and it translated into higher student performance. Yeah. So you have, like, yeah, you have to have the balance between the basics and technology. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. that's okay. going to have to be the last word. Okay. And technology is used to enhance the basics. Mm -hmm. It's not yes. a right. separate. And in yeah. fact, the it's board, board yeah, very it have to be recently, the tool, not, not the, mm -hmm. the, no. the very end, recently you know, um, with the, the, with the uh, requirements in high school. You know, we used to have just a... Now it's required. Yeah. yeah. Just you, know. a, you can see the kind of discussion that Public Square starts, but this is where we have to leave it right now because we're out of time. I want to thank our participants for being with us tonight, uh, particularly Superintendent Picard, Ms. Buquet, Ms. Washington. And we'll be back with some final comments right after this. 
Well, after our discussion wrapped up, we again surveyed the participants and compared their responses with the earlier results. And we found some very interesting really things, was. Charlie. Um, one of the questions we asked was about rating the school systems. We compared Louisiana school systems to those in the southeast, and there was a remarkably more positive attitude. We're now moving from uh, uh, many thought we were worse, uh, and now to a majority saying we're about the same. As other states in the southeast. There was also, Beth, uh, something interesting in terms of what people people think will happen in the future. But going into the program, the people we surveyed who took part in the program tonight thought that about 50% of them thought that things would get better. But after the program, 80% of them were willing to say that they believe things will get better. And in terms of testing, uh, about 40% uh, at the beginning thought we had too much testing. And at the end of the program, about 50% said we had it about right in terms of testing. But when we asked them what would make the most significant difference in uh, public schools, they overwhelmingly, 100% of our participants said more technology in place would help kids learn better. Although uh, they had comments at the end of the t exams as well, and they said uh, technology wasn't the only thing. But overwhelmingly, they did think it was a positive thing. And I guess the most compelling thing is that at the very end, we asked the role government should play where parents are not stepping in in terms of education for their children. And 70% said government should play a role in they're, public education. They're ready for government to step in and do something about education in Louisiana. And that wraps up the Louisiana Public Square for this month. We hope you enjoy the program. You too can become part of Public Square by taking our online survey on education at lpb.org. Next month, Public Square goes to New Orleans to talk about health care. We'll be originating our program from LSU's new virtual hospital in New Orleans, where high-tech tools are being used to teach medical students. Until next month, for Charles Zewi and Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Beth Courtney. Good evening. A home video of this program is available. For more information, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.